back to iStream TV. We are here live from a Brighton Music Conference on Brighton Beach. And in the Audio Mango of studio van we are in right now, I have a very special guest in the shape of Simon Shackleton. Hi, Sasha. So good to see you. It's been it ages. Is so good, Shaq. So, so some people may know Shaq as many different guises. Um, I know him as Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I always think of you. I know. Well, that's that's kind of how, like, my surname's Shackleton, so that's how uh, that started out. I mean, these days I, I kind of go by anything, as long as it's not an insult. I'm yes. Happy, you, know. <laughs> you can call me anything, yeah, as long whatever. as it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I first came in contact with Simon he was uh, known as Elite Force um, a big part of your life Elite Force wasn't it? It was yeah I mean I can't believe that I actually released my first Elite Force record 26 years ago wow. which is outrage it was like wow. 96 or something I didn't realise it was quite so early yeah, yeah. and you know I'd been I'd actually been I'd been DJ before that I've been DJing for seven years so I started in 89 I think in the kind of acid house so you played in acid um, house in them days yeah well actually I I got my first start as a DJ playing at this huge st- uh, student night in Exeter where I was at university at the time right and um and I, I was really good friends with Tom York from Radiohead. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so we, we were in a band together. We, he was, you know, a, a student at the art college. And we started making music together. But because he was the DJ at the big student night, he had a bit more disposable income than I did. <laughs> so he'd always turn up with these amazing kind of white labels and stuff. And I just worked as a, I worked as a bouncer at the club right. to make a bit of money. Right. And then when he left to uh, to do Radiohead, I just like filled his boots basically. And not, I, I'd never DJed before, but my first DJ set, I think was 89 and I played for five hours. It was like a open till close sort of deal wow. to a thousand people and I'd, I'd never owned What a owned story Shaq, <laughs> so, I never knew that and oh, that's, oh that's amazing in story. In the deep end right? Yeah <laughs> uh, you're a Radiohead fan? I am, I'm a huge Radiohead fan I, I've, I, it was amazing back in back in those days as well, we, we actually released a couple of singles which are quite rare now oh. um, as a student band um but I remember, you know, I remember sitting down with Tom in a, in a student house that we used to write all our tracks and, um, you know, and rehearse in. And I, m- I remember him coming back, I think it must be 1990 by then or 91, but he came back from um, from the holidays with this new track and he sat down and played as Creep on his acoustic <gasps> guitar. Oh my God. Just in, in the living room. And he's like, you know, and he's all kind of like, he's, oh, he's, wow. he's got his head down a bit and he's just literally done this acoustic version of it. <gasps> and then there was silence and everyone's sort of, that was amazing. And he's like, yeah, the, the problem is the, the record company want to put it as a B-side because it's got swearing in it and we don't really want them to take the swearing out. So it's just going to be a B-side. And we're like, dude, that's incredible. Oh my God. Um, was it a B-side in the end? I, I'm not. I don't think it was. I mean, it was obviously the track that broke them in America. Of course, yeah. Um, but it may have been in the UK that it actually did come out on a and then a B-side. got re-released. Yeah, and then it was yeah. so big. Um, oh my God, that is an incredible story. <laughs> and are you still are you still in contact with Tom? Um, very very vaguely. I mean, we have we have quite a lot of mutual friends mm. who um, I've actually just recently started rehearsing for. Um, for a live show that I'm planning to do as Simon Shackleton, which the the goal at the moment is to launch it at ADE this year. Right. Um, and we have a, a really good mutual friend, like Tom and I have this very good mutual friend called John Matthias, who is a he's a he's a, a prodigious violinist. And the music I'm making at the moment is very much kind of emotive electronica. And uh, John's a perfect fit as a as a violin player on these um, on these pieces, and he's agreed to do some of the live shows. Um, but he also did the string parts on the first three Radiohead albums, I think. I can um, see where all this influence right, is coming yeah. back through. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's so interesting because because actually, like my my college days, it's it's amazing. Like we we had this little crew of people. And we really punched above our weight. We were all at, at Exeter University at the time. And um, 
you know, I I had one of my best friends at the time, one of my close friends was Frank Tope, who ended up being editor of uh, Mix Mag. Um, obviously, Tom doing his Radiohead stuff, and then the guys that took over the student house I was in when I left. Um, one of them is Felix Buxton from Basement Jacks, <laughs> right. and he then took on he took on the job after I. I left and moved up to London being right. the DJ at the student night. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. I love these stories. They're amazing. So so you uh, you started off there. Quite, um, couldn't have been a, a better place to uh, start. Training ground. Um, influences. Uh, yeah. You, you, uh, I'm, I'm quite dumbfounded by them, to be honest. But um, So then you moved. Tell us how Late Force happened. Well, I, you know, I moved up to London and uh, I actually signed a publishing deal with MCA, which was like a development deal. Um, and they gave us enough money to be able to equip me and my mate, Howie, uh, we equipped a studio and started to learn how to make electronic music. So I was at college, I actually did a degree in classical music. So right. I was like classically trained. And I, I used to do, I actually ran a contemporary music festival in Exeter, which I I set up myself uh, to bring in these sort of avant-garde classical composers from all over the world. So I, I had a I had a finger in a lot of different pies when I was there. But when I moved up to London, um, me and my mate Howie started making music. We formed a band called Flicker Noise, and we signed to Deconstruction actually, and did a couple of singles with them. Right. And then that all kind of folded, and then we formed another band called Lunatic Calm, and we we actually did. That was the first good, one I heard of. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so we had, you know, we had some tracks used on some big movies around then, like The Matrix, the original That's Matrix, right. um, Spider Man, Charlie's Angels, a few other things. And then as a sort of side hustle, I started doing this music as a leap force. So I was I was a bit frustrated that the Lunatic Calm stuff. It was with a major label, so it took quite a long time for things to go from... I was finishing it and getting it and out. Lots of red I, tape. Yeah, I was just like jonesing to get the music mm. out there. And I'd started DJing again in London. Had a few... I'd set up a label called Fused and Bruised. And we had a residency at the Dog Star in Brixton. And then we had a few others where we'd be doing, like residences at second rooms at big drum and bass nights because right. we was we were pretty eclectic we we're doing some breaks some house um some techno just a mixed bag really and um an elite force kind of came out of that that was the first thing i released one of the first things i released on on fused and bruised and it grew in tandem to lunatic calm right. and then sort of come 2000 2001 i started getting a lot of bookings as and the break force. scene was really kicking off at that point wasn't yeah. it yeah. yeah so yeah. i was you know for the next sort of 15 years i was pounding the pavement doing that pounding the pavement touring the world absolutely yeah air miles getting racked up here and there and playing anywhere from i played a lot in some really interesting locations like mainland china I, I used to go and play in every three months or four months um kazakhstan you know it's just yeah it's i sent a few djs to kazakhstan right, it's so deepest dark de- deepest <laughs> darkest siberia i sent a few to as well oh God, crazy <laughs> some of those some of those adventures were were really interesting because you you know you felt like at the time it was a new frontier really yeah for electronic music yeah, yeah, yeah. and I had that the first time round. I had that in the UK with Acid House then I had it again going out to the States for the first time in sort of 97, 98 where electronica was just starting to happen Yeah. and then again in some of these countries in uh, sort of beyond Europe where like in China for example people would just um for the first time there's like emerging middle class that had a bit of disposable income and they yeah. were like let's make a club let's yeah some music yeah 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 there's some amazing clubs in those kind of areas incredible yeah yeah and and um it really kicked off in the states as well for you didn't it it did yeah i mean the states has probably been my biggest market for years and years i've done a lot of tours i toured with crystal method a That's few right, times yeah. like full-on five-week tour bus tours when we were doing the lunatic calm stuff and then i've been a regular djing out there since 2000 really and um yeah it's like there's a few cities there like san francisco 
and Denver and LA that are like home from home for me really so yeah you're out there regularly aren't you I have been over the years not so much in the last sort of few years obviously yeah. COVID and yeah, also yeah. I've just like stepped back from DJing a bit and focusing more on the um, on the live side of things so and, and while we're uh, talking about the states we can't not touch upon the burn <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> I, I tell you what, Shaq, I have a, uh, a really, really, really vivid and strong memory of my first burn um, when I had taken my other DJ. So you were already a bit of a veteran as far as I was concerned at that point. Um, but I took my newer DJ. So Will Bailey, I took out there. He'd been there the year before. Um, he told me when he came back that all he did was sit in a tent and heat up. <laughs> It's a disaster. That's a long way to go. I was like, why didn't you leave your tent? <laughs> you could microwave yourself and save a bit of money. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So um, so Jeffa, um, mm. the leader of the Roots Society, originally contacted Will Bailey on MySpace. Um, and that was how that relationship started. So it was the year after um, that Jeffa asked me if I would like to take more of my DJs to the desert. And so I took JD Whiston off. Filthy Rich and Will Bailey once again um, and it was uh, quite a journey and quite a trip and quite a mental week uh, but it did change my life 100% mm. and I have a very 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 strong and vivid memory of standing on the Tower of Babel <laughs> with you playing uh, you were wearing the most epic white fur coat <laughs> That I was so <laughs> jealous of. I mean, oh, I was so jealous of this with some uh, beautiful purple glittery flares. Sounds about right. You looked amazing. <laughs> um, you the the force and the energy that you created uh, behind those decks um, were wielding. It was something that was truly out of this world oh thank you and i i do genuinely mean that from the bottom of my heart like i you know i've seen a few of your sets in the desert um but that one i was standing next to you yeah um and it's a different feeling obviously as to when you're dancing in the crowd as when to you're standing next yeah. to a dj and you're uh, you know you're channeling it yeah tell I mean, us about that <coughs> tell us oh my gosh. Go on. i mean, i I, the, the first the first year that I went out there, um, it, it it I didn't know what to expect, and I'd had people like burning my ear off about it for years and years, and I was like, I was actually a, a bit pissed off about it. I was <laughs> like, oh, I just it's just another festival, right? Uh -huh. And I'd played Glastonbury, and I played all the all the big festivals. I've and, done that. Yeah, it's nice, <laughs> like it's just you know whatever. And I went out there a little bit blasé, but I thought I'd take a, I thought I'd take a punt on it, and I flew out, and um, and I'd been uh, like a good friend of mine, Sid Grizz from um, San Francisco, had, had asked me to play at Opulent Temple, and to do a back-to-back -back set with Meet Katie on Burn Night for two and a half hours on that first year, and I had no idea what to expect, and we knew that it was a big deal. So we spent five days in the studio preparing for that one DJ set. Neither of us did that normally, mm -hmm. but that's how we we knew it was a big deal. Everybody that had been told, you know, told us it was going to be, and and so we we rehearsed that set. We did every track was edited, every single track in the two and a half set was like a bespoke little edit that we'd done. And I remember that the week before that, Underworld. Um, had Downpipe coming out which is one of my all time favourite mm -hmm. like club tracks absolutely love it which they did with Mark Knight and Dee Ramirez and we knew D, D Ramirez so he he gave us an advanced copy of it nobody else had it in the desert and we got there and we, we're playing you know we're playing this set to 5,000 people we're controlling the fire mm. in that, ca oh, in no, that yes, camp which is just insane <laughs> fire at your fingertips yeah you know? You're playing to 5,000 people, and the energy was just extraordinary. I remember, I remember dropping that track. Nobody had heard it before, and we were the only people that had copies of it. And it was one of the most electric moments I've ever experienced Ooh. behind the decks. And it was, it was almost like, you know, I came away from the desert with that sensation just bottled, you know. And and then, and then I, I kind of took took the cork out of the bottle when I got back. And then just figured out a way to amplify it. Yeah. So next year I was going back. I'm gonna, uh, and I decided I'd, 
I'd be really selective with what sets I handpicked to play there. And each year it became like a way of trying some new things. So I started doing these sunrise sets, which That's gave right me a, a yeah. chance to do something a lot deeper and a lot longer as well. So I was playing six, seven, eight hours at those and playing a lot of music that I didn't normally get a chance to play. And, and really it, it um, every set that I did out there just became like a sort of inspiration for the year ahead. So it's like my New Year's Eve. You know? I remember you telling me this. I, me- I remember you saying that... Um, when uh, looking at, well, listening to records over the years or listening to music over the years, it was always in the back of your mind, how will this work at the burn? Yeah, you know, it wasn't just that, but it was like, right, this track, this track's going in my box because I know that at 7.20 at district it's going to be just right because the sun's just going to be going down and it's going to be like (sighs) you know it's indescribable that feeling isn't it like i I remember when i first went to the burn everybody said those words of nothing can prepare you yeah yeah really and i you know i took I, i actually over the years i took lots of people out there who'd never been there before and it was a new experience for them but they were the same as me when they first went out there. It's like, yeah, I've been to festivals. It's like, yeah, there's going to be some hippies. There's going to be some people doing whatever. And then they got there. And I remember these like these Australian lads that um, I travelled in with from San Francisco who I knew from going out to Australia and playing out there. And they were, they were all kind of full of it and stuff. And then we, you know, we, we got the bikes out. We arrived on the plier and we cycled off. And within 15 minutes, they were like, this is too much. This is we can't have this at all. They really, they and they cope. literally turned around and went back, and, and I didn't see them for about no. They they uh-uh. stayed in their RV for about twelve hours, and then <laughs> and then the, you know, and then the door opens, and this little face peeks out. I know, I know exactly <laughs> like, what. Whoa. whoa, man, <laughs> we just got. It was all a bit too much for us. Yeah, <laughs> but isn't it amazing it, it, when art can do that? When it, it's it that is. special and it's that overwhelming, and and and, and I'm sure people have had similar experiences at Glastonbury and similar experiences at you know some of the big festivals around the world but you know if you've if you've been there and you've experienced that sense of elevation like Mm. experiential elevation Mm. above anything that you might have seen before it just there's a new bar yeah totally literally just raised the bar it is totally I mean the first time I went to the bar and I was going through a very very difficult time in my life um, and there was so much wrong before I left the UK um, and when I got to the burn it's one of the things when you walk into Burning Man is it's like you're being stripped oh yeah um, of of everything basically <laughs> <laughs> Literally everything, Every, you know, any preconceptions, any things that you're, you know, holding around you, you're kind of stripped bare as you walk through. Um, and and one of the greatest things that the burn taught me yeah. was that even though my life felt like absolute nightmare before I got there, within 48 hours I was having the time of my life. Yeah. Uh, everything had gone all of the pain all of the worry all of those things was gone yeah um and i'd released it and i was able to really feel happy again yeah um even though you know i had to go back to it at one point yeah. but it was that release yeah um it felt like my first rave that i'd ever walked into right. yeah um and and that was it's a very healing place yeah what a thing that is you know what and bear in mind that that community that builds that city does it through love of doing something really cool for somebody else it's not a it's not a transactional thing yeah it's a together thing yeah we're just going to make this thing because it's amazing and we know it's going to blow people's minds exactly we're we're being tapped did you hear us being tapped (laughs) we're just getting started (laughs) we're just getting started we're gonna have to do i'm i'm going to bring the van to you at some point i'm definitely gonna bring so before we do wrap up hopefully we're all right out there but before we do wrap up tell us all about what you're doing now um yeah just very quick Quickly, I mean, I'm I'm now uh, I'm creating a lot of music as Simon Shackleton, so under my real name. Um, just put out uh, just put out a single with um, Angina Deep. Um, have a, a track coming out with Nick Warren on Soundgarden um, in the summer. 
And then, you know, I have a whole range of uh, tracks that are coming out towards the end of this year. And I'm hoping that um, at ADE this year, I'll be doing the first Simon Shackleton live shows with a with a live drummer, live violinist. And it's it's going to be very kind of musical, organic, musical mm. and intimate and Beautiful. almost like the kind of antithesis of EDM, really, as much as anything. So, Brilliant. I love that. You know. I love that. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, keep it locked on to Shaq's socials. Simon Shackleton is not on Facebook. Uh, yeah, simonshackleton.org is my website, so that's probably the so easiest way. So from there onwards, you can go outwards. Um, so yeah, we are being tapped, so we're going to have to wrap it, this interview up. But we will see Simon uh, very soon, and uh, we'll be back with the next interview in about 15 minutes. I want you to get up. <laughs>